It was the summer of 2007, probably as hot as it is now. My wife and I had one child, seems like another life ago, nine-month-old son. He had been through a phase where he would wake up right across the hall in his crib and cry. And I would go in in the middle of the night and I'd pick him up, bring him back to my bed and lay with him just for a minute. And he'd go right back to sleep. And then I'd get back out of the bed, take him back to his crib and then put him back. And then he'd just sleep the rest of the night. It wasn't too bad, right? Well, this one night, uh, he woke up around 2, 2.30. Like I said, just, it just been a few days he'd been doing this. So I went in and got him. Man, walked across the hall, put him in our, our bed and lay there. And after a few minutes, I thought to myself, well, time to go put him back. But I just, you know, I didn't feel like putting him back. I just didn't. And uh, I said, you know what, I'll just let him sleep with us tonight in the bed. About two hours later at 4.30 in the morning, smoke alarms went off in his room. There was a fire in his room, right? Normally he'd been in there for who knows how long, right? with the smoke and everything. So I woke up forgetting he had been in the bed and ran into his room and saw the fire and thought someone had stolen my baby and set my house ablaze. <laughs> Very confused. We realized he was in the bed and we got him out and called the fire department and everything. Long story short, uh, we had a fire. We often talk about how clearly, clearly God was in that. Amen. Clearly God woke him up. Clearly, God told me, you know what? Just leave me in your bed today. Only God can do things like that. Amen. You probably have a story like that that has happened in your life. Today, we're talking about the things only God can do. Only God can do. We're in Isaiah 33, starting in verse 2. I'm just going to read through verse 6. <clears throat> oh, Lord. Be gracious to us. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in time of trouble. At the tumultuous noise, peoples flee. When you lift yourself up, nations are scattered, and your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers, as locust sleep it is leapt upon. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. And he will be the stability of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Father in heaven, as we read this, Lord, we pray that you would be the stability of our times. Our personal lives, our church lives, the lives that we live here in this town and state, nation. You would bring stability to us that only you can today. Father, I pray that, that you would uh, speak through me today in this message, that your Holy Spirit would speak forth, that those in here today and those watching online would receive your word today and realize that only you could do certain things in, your, in their lives and they would turn to you for those. But we love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we read through this book of Isaiah, I'm in 33 today. I skipped ahead a couple of days. And at this point in Israel's history, the northern kingdom, which was called Israel, had been destroyed by the kingdom of Assyria. Assyria had been going through and destroying countries left and right. And in a 20, 10 to 20 year siege, the northern kingdom of Israel finally fell. And now the Assyrians were, were on the doorstep of Judah. The southern kingdom, its capital, being Jerusalem. And this is where Isaiah prophesied. This is where he served. This is where he spoke the word of the Lord. And because of King Hezekiah, one of the few good kings, and his devotion to God, the Assyrian army were on the doorsteps, but they never conquered Jerusalem. Hezekiah actually invited some of the surviving northern kingdom citizens to come and live in Jerusalem. But there was this constant threat of the Assyrians potentially conquering Judah. 
So the citizens were constantly torn between trusting the Lord or giving in to what seemed like the inevitability of a conquering foreign nation. But as we're seeing from our pastors today, only God can help you. Only God can help you in your times of trouble. So I want to give you today four ways that God can help you. That only God can help you in your circumstances. Number one, only God can bring salvation to your life. Only God can bring salvation to your life. Many of you know this truth. Many of you know this truth. But it's worth really sinking in and thinking about. In the previous chapters, God's people have been looking to Egypt, of all places, for possible help from the Assyrian invasion. In fact, before these, in these chapters before, Isaiah spoke a lot to them about not putting their trust in Egypt to save them from Assyria, but, but to put their trust in the Lord. And apparently, miraculously, that people actually listened. <laughs> One of the few times we see this in the prophets, they listened to them. Verse 2, they said, O oh Lord, be gracious to you. We wait for you. Be our arm every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble. <clears throat> it's a wonderful sound when God's people finally call out to the Lord. Amen? It's a wonderful sound when God's stubborn, obstinate, sinful, wandering people finally call out to the Lord. They finally realize that that only God can save them, that, that only God can give them the salvation that they need. And as such, the people now put faith, their faith in how God will, will ultimately deliver them. This is what they're saying. You will deliver us. And again, God had not delivered them yet. But they're praising him as if he already has. And that they will, he will deliver them from this threat. He said in verse 3, At the tumultuous noise, peoples flee. When you lift yourself up, nations are scattered. And your spoil is gathered as the caterpillar gathers his locust leap it is left upon. What he's saying is that God's people are anticipating a day where their enemies are vanquished. And they will be as numerous as insects, picking up the spoil of their enemies. And this would only be made possible because God alone brings salvation. The struggle for looking to others to save us is nothing new. And even if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've received him for salvation, still every day in our lives we still are prone and tempted to look at false saviors who promise things that only God can give us. We all have those temptations. What is it for you? What what are you tempted by to save you? What are you tempted by to to come into your life and ease your pain? What, What do you look for toward? God gives us many good things in this life and But when we make them our saviors, they become problems. God's given us family. We love our families. We do anything for our families. But our families can't save us. Our spouse can't save us. Our children can't save us. Our parents can't save us. They can give us wisdom. They can give us advice and support and love. But they can't save you from whatever you're going through. What about friends? Friends are the same way. God gives us friends, but they can't save us. Sometimes we develop codependent relationships on people, thinking that they're going to help us at all times, and they can't. Maybe you look outside of relationships, and maybe you look to your career advancement or your retirement to save you. Maybe it's education, knowledge. Maybe it's money and wealth, assets, security. 
Maybe it's just things like nice cars or big trucks, which we don't have any of those in Monk's Corner. <laughs> Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. It's you run to when times are hard. For young people, maybe it's being cool, fitting in. We all look to people or things to save us. We look to them all to give us a little relief from the outside invasion coming into our lives. We all feel the Assyrians at our door threatening us. But like God's people, we must be reminded that God is the only one who saves. Only God can bring salvation to your life. Secondly, only God can bring flourishing to your life. Only God can bring flourishing. When something flourishes, when something thrives, only God can bring that. Verse 5. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice, righteousness. See, when God is our Savior, when he's your Savior and my Savior, our collective Savior, he fills people, he fills people with justice. He fills people with righteousness. When God is, is king in our lives, we are people who are just. We are people who are fair. We are people who are righteous. When God is exalted, we flourish. We become the best version of ourselves when Jesus Christ is truly leading us and we're following. We become the best version when God is exalted. He brings flourishing to our lives. Verse 6. And will be the stability of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom and knowledge, the fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. See, when we, when we put God first... We flourish. He brings that, I love that phrase, that stability in our times. Isn't that what most of us are looking for? Stability in our times. When you have an unstable culture, when you have an unstable city or nation, you can bet, you can guarantee that people are not putting God first. If there's instability, they're putting themselves first. But putting God first enables us to put others first, which is what we're called to do. You've heard of the acronym before, haven't you? Joy, Jesus first, others second, yourself third. Well, people don't live a joyful life. They live a yogful life. <laughs> Get it? Yourself first, others second, Jesus third. Or maybe it's Yaj, I don't know, English major. That's the world we live in. Putting God first enables us to put others first. Only God can bring stability to a country. Only God can bring stability to a community, to a church, to a family, to any organization. And he gives us an abundance of salvation. And when we put him first, he gives us an abundance of wisdom. And he gives us an abundance of knowledge. If you can think of a governmental policy that makes no sense, you know why it doesn't make sense? Because it's not wise. <laughs> and why is it not wise? Because whoever put it together did not seek the Lord, I guarantee you. Seeking the Lord is fearing the Lord. Respecting the Lord. But how do you respect a God you don't believe in? Well, you can't. The irony is that only God could bring the stability to our lives that we all so desperately seek. Three, only God can bring peace to your life. Only God can bring peace to your life. We see in verses 7 through 12 the opposite of peace. We see disobedience and judgment. But only God can bring peace. Look at verse 7. Behold, their heroes cry in the streets, the envoys of peace weep bitterly. If you take this verse 
Look at different translations. You'll see wildly different translations because the Hebrew, most scholars will say, is really unintelligible. They, they can't translate it because there's nothing to look at. When you translate words, you have to have other contexts to look at and things. And so no one really knows what verse 7 means. They kind of have an idea. But what it is is the beginning of a section of a lament. The next few verses paint a picture of moral corruption. They paint a picture of spiritual depravity and desolation. It paints a picture of the opposite of flourishing, and that is decline. The opposite of peace, and that is judgment. And this is what we see here, verse 8. He says, the highways lay waste, the traveler ceases. Covenants are broken. Cities are despised. There's no regard for man. The land mourns and languishes. The land mourns and languishes, it says. Lebanon is confounded and withers away. Sharon is like a desert and Bashan and Carmel shake off their leaves. When God is judging a land, as he was judging Israel and parts of Judah this time, when God is judging a land, there's no peace. There's no regard for mankind, which is why the judgment's coming. And it says, even nature cries out and mourns. It makes you wonder about the connection between moral depravity and natural disasters. It just makes you wonder about it. I remember when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans 2005 or so. There's the Southern Baptist Seminary down there. Of course, New Orleans has a lot of spiritual darkness. People were quick to jump on the fact that this is God's judgment for New Orleans. And then as soon as people jumped on that, people were quick to jump back on it and say, well, how do you know? It may not be. It might just be the weather. Well, we may never know the truth about that one. But the Bible tells us very here, right here, that there's a connection between disobedience, moral depravity, and natural disasters. Even when, when things are so bad, the Bible says, even the land acts up. Even the land cries out. And it makes you wonder if the problems we have in our climate, which everyone agrees that it has changed on some level, it makes you wonder if the problems we have in our climate are related to our spiritual condition. Many would scoff at that. They would scoff at there being a spiritual connection. But the Bible seems to, to speak to that. Some would say that, that it's humanity's fault for the extreme weather we're having, the heat we're having. Eighteen have died in Arizona this week from the heat. But what if the extreme weather was not caused by our negligence? What if it wasn't caused by things we put in the air, what if it was caused by our moral and spiritual depravity? Oh, yeah. Mankind did cause climate change, but not in the way you think. That seems to be what is being hinted at here, what Isaiah is saying. Well, we don't know, and I'm not trying to make a statement on that. I'm just saying we think we have it all figured out, don't we? We think we have the whole world figured out how to solve everybody's problems. The Bible tells us, whoa, it's more complicated than that. It's a spiritual issue. It's a moral issue. Because God will not allow moral depravity to continue to exist. Look at verse 10. He says, now I will arise, now I will lift myself up, and now I will be exalted. There comes a day where God steps in, he gets up, he rises, and he judges. And that's what he says. Now I'm stepping up, right? I know, I know what he feels like. I'll be sitting in my recliner, reading, watching something. And I'll hear a little scream in the house from a kid. And I'll hear another scream. And then I'll hear some scream so horrible it can't possibly be made by a child. And then that's when dad gets up and takes names. Amen. 
I think the, I think the Father's the same way. Gives us a lot of grace. But then he gets up. When he gets up, he's coming with the rod. Look at verse 11. He says, you conceive chaff, you give birth to stubble, your breath is a fire that will consume you, and the peoples will be as burned to lime like thorns cut down that are burned to fire. People give birth, he says, to chaff, to, to, uh, to, to stubble, which is useless things. When, when we're wicked, we give birth to uselessness. That's what we're conceiving, uselessness. And he says, your own actions bring their own destruction. One of the pushbacks that we get, you may get, or that you may, you may even have, for modern people is why would God judge people? Especially the, the doctrine of hell. Why would God do that? Well, over and over, the Bible makes it very clear that people are not condemned by God. They're not condemned by God. They're condemned by their own sin, their own actions. Look at John 3, starting at verse 16. Many of you know 316, but you don't know maybe 17 and 18. Look at 316. For God so loved the world, loved the world so much, that he gave his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. We know that part, right? Amen. But verse 17 gives us more a context, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That's not why Jesus came. Jesus did not come to condemn you or me. We were condemned already. But in order that the world might be saved through him, that's why Jesus came. Jesus is not God's judgment. Jesus is God's salvation. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already because he did not believe in the name of the only Son of God. The opposite of peace is judgment. We bring judgment into our own lives, but through Jesus, God brings peace. Only God can bring the peace that you need. Number four. And only God can bring security to your life. Only God can bring security to your life. Verse 13 says this, Hear, you who are far off, oh, we missed it, oh, we're good. You who are far off what I have done, and you who are near, acknowledge my might. See, when people hear about the works of God, people hear about what God's done, it has one of two effects. One, they'll run to him for salvation. Or two, they'll run from him for separation. That's how we are. When we have unconfessed sin in our lives, we don't want to be in here. <laughs> but when we turn to Jesus, this is where we want to be, amen. Amen. This is where we want to be. Most Israelites ran from him. Verse 14 says this, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Trembling has seized the godless. Who among us can dwell with the consuming fire? Who among us can dwell with everlasting burnings? And the answer is that no one can unless they've been made right by the blood of Jesus. Look at Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't come for us because we're good. We have it all figured out. What would the point be? I don't help my children when they don't need help. That's called getting in the way. <laughs> I help them when they need it. Verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. God saves us from his own wrath through Jesus. Our sin has to be dealt with somewhere, somehow, or he wouldn't be a just God, a righteous God. And you want a just God in your life, trust me. 
We've been made right. We've been justified to God by Jesus. We're righteous in our standing before God, not because of anything we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. So to live, we live this this righteous life because Jesus compels us to through his spirit that is in every believer. If you know Jesus Christ, me and you have one common bond at least. And it's the most powerful bond you can have. And that is the unity of the Holy Spirit. You have the same Spirit of God in you that I do. Look at Ezekiel 36, 27. And I will put my Spirit within you and cause you. He does the work. Cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my rules. We're born again, which is how we can walk in his ways. This is how we can withstand this, this consuming fire of God. Look at verse 15. He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, who despises the gain of oppressions, who shakes his hands lest they hold a bribe, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, who shuts his eyes from looking on evil, he will dwell on the heights. His place of defense will be the fortresses of rocks. His bread will be given him. His water will be sure. Only God can bring us that security we so desperately seek. Only God can bring us that water that lasts forever. Only God can give us that fortress of rocks that we need when the day of adversity is here. Only God. God. We're going to have our time of response today. How is the Lord speaking to you? Are you guilty of turning to other saviors? Are you guilty of running to other people or things rather than God? Let me ask you a question. I ask myself when I'm guilty of that. How's that working for you? It's not. Maybe today you need to repent from that and come running back to Jesus, and he's there for you. Maybe you, that you find yourself today in a big struggle. Big struggle, big adversity. I'm down here every, every morning. I'm more than willing to pray for you. I might not hold your hand today, but I'm more than willing to pray for you. More than willing to come down front on the steps and pray to the Lord today. Maybe you've been running from God your whole life, and today's the day. Today's the day that, that you've called out to God to save you. Now you're ready to turn to him for salvation. Now you're ready to be born again. Now you're ready to be his child. Today is the decision to make, make that decision today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son. As you look down upon mankind, and you knew from the garden, Lord, Ab and Eve, very beginning of time, as we know it, that we were going to need help. Lord, you created us to bring you glory. You save us to bring you glory and to bring us goodness. Surely, Lord, your goodness saves us. And Father, the, your word says that your kindness leads us to repentance. So Father, today as we close our time together, that we would turn back to you, what you've given us. We would praise your name for your salvation. That we would run to you, because only you can do the things in our lives that we need. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.